in the Gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold. Guys, sow your thousand dollar seed and you'll get a hundredfold. Once again, you could take that out of context right there. But he shall receive a hundredfold. So, so many people do this and people don't even read the Bible. And like I said, is there a sense at which you could uh, sow into somebody financially and reap some kind of harvest? Most definitely so, yes. But not in the way that these prosperity preachers are teaching that's the case. All right, hey everyone, how's it going? It's your brother Noah Hines. And in this video today, I'm going to be addressing the topic of the sowing and reaping deception. Now, I do know that sowing and reaping is a biblical concept, but I'm talking about it in the sense of you treat God like a slot machine. Like you sow money and you will get a financial increase indefinitely. You give to get, things of that nature. This is very big in the charismatic movement. And I think some of you who follow my channel are still into this practice, have this mindset, or are uncertain about it. And I'm also going to be talking about how you shouldn't charge for deliverance because people still continually come to me about that. But one thing that I want to say, as I am creating, you guys know who follow my channel that I've created various different videos about how false teachers manipulate people for money and the biblical attitude that we should take towards giving. And I just want to reiterate the truth of the matter because I could debunk all these different lies but really, the word of God says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So the truth of how we are supposed to give in the New Testament is found in the book of 2 Corinthians as every man purposes in his heart. That is the standard that we should uh, keep. Not because you feel like you have to tithe or you're going to have an open door to demons. Not because of this sowing and reaping deception that I'm going to be talking about. Not because you, you sow money to get deliverance, you charge for deliverance. Uh, all these different things, if you just know the truth of what the Word of God says in 2 Corinthians, that you shouldn't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, but God lives a, uh, God loves a cheerful giver, and let every man give as, as he purposes in his heart. That is the standard that I believe that we should follow in the New Testament. And if you just follow that, you won't fall into these other deceptions with regards to giving money for ministry that are out there nowadays. But anyways, I did just want to address once again, you guys, once again, who follow my ministry, you know this, but there's always new people still coming to me asking me, how much do you charge for a session? How much for deliverance? Everything like that. And I just think to myself, man, is there really that many wolves out there? Is there really that many manipulative people out there where people think it's like a standard to charge money for deliverance? So I just want to say, you should never be charged for deliverance. And I'll take it a step further. You shouldn't pay a mandatory fee for deliverance either because then you are enabling somebody who is manipulating you. You are enabling a hireling. You are an enabling a manipulator. And the word of God actually teaches that that is bad as well too because it says in the word of God, Jesus said, freely give as you have freely received. So many people catch that first part where it says freely give. We need to freely give. But it also says, as you have freely received. So God wants you to receive these spiritual blessings such as deliverance freely. So if you're not receiving them freely, you're paying money for them. That is actually bad as well too. So never pay a mandatory fee for something that God wants you to receive freely. Not only is it wrong on the, the minister's part if they do that, but also the recipient of the ministry. Obviously, the, the minister, the, the selfishly inspired, the selfishly ambitious minister is more at fault, but still, nevertheless, don't give in to the uh, manipulation. Don't give in to enabling that individual, right? Because it shows that you have impatience and bad discernment. You're, you're tormented by demons and you're just like, somebody help me. Okay, I don't care. I'll pay this guy. I'll pay that guy. Just pray for me instantly. And when you're anxious and impatient like that, it's not a good, it's never a good disposition to be in with regards to ministry. That's how you get duped by false ministries when you have that impatient, um, ungodly kind of desperate persona, right? We should be desperate for deliverance, desperate to have an encounter with the Lord, but not in the sense of which you're anxious and you're just like, I just need somebody to immediately pray for me or I'm going to explode. I understand that torment is bad, especially when you're first born again. But still, nevertheless, if you have patience and wait for God to re lead you to the right person 
it's always so much better, right? So I understand that torment. I'm not trying to be dismissive of that, but I just right out of the gate wanted to establish those two things that you shouldn't uh, be being charged for deliverance ever. You can give donations, um, you know, as, as God puts it in your heart to provide for ministries, to support ministries, definitely do so. But I don't understand why ministries charge and manipulate and do all these things because I don't do that. I believe by God's grace. And um, God provides for me all the time as I'm doing ministry full time. So I guess I do understand why because of covetousness and, and fear and selfish ambition. But I don't understand in another sense. Anyways, guys, aside from that, now I'm really going to be getting into the meat of what I wanted to deal with regards to this message. And this is this whole concept of sowing a financial seed so that you get a financial harvest back. Like you sow a thousand dollar seed and then God's going to give you more multiple thousand dollar seeds. Or if you just keep sowing into the right ministry, financial, financial giving, then you're going to get a, a nice house. You're going to get a nice car. You're going to get your deliverance. You're going to get the marriage that you want. You're going to get the job that you want. All these different things. That is not the way you have diverted away from faith. And now you are thinking that you can get from something from God by giving. And we're going to go over a direct scripture that says that you shouldn't do that on the Sermon on the Mount. But yes, this movement could or this practice could go by various different uh, terms. Sowing your financial seed. Uh, sowing, like if you sow to earn from God anything. Money, favor, deliverance. So a thousand dollar seed, all these different things. There's there's somebody online recent, and this goes all, on all the time. But somebody I saw recently, so a thousand dollar seed, and I'll pray for you that you get your spouse. So I I don't understand how people are deceived by it. I mean I do, but it's just so deceptive and so blatantly wrong. But um, I do want to say you can reap spiritual benefits when sowing. Once again, I do want to affirm, I do believe there is a spiritual concept of what you sow, you will reap, right? The Word of God talks about that in, in a general sense. Um, so I'm not even completely opposed to you using that term, right? Like if people say they want to sow a seed into your ministry, I'm not completely opposed to that, right? You could use that term. I'm not legalistic about the terminology, but the practice of thinking that you can treat God like a slot machine, that godliness is a, you think godliness is a means of gain. And that, you know, like, why isn't every Christian a billionaire? If you can just put in money, you get more, you put in money, get more, you just keep getting more and more from God with financial gain when you put money in then why isn't every Christian a millionaire, a billionaire? Why is it that it's the false teachers that are really reaping these benefits, but the average congregants aren't seeing that same uh, benefit? That doesn't make any sense, right? I, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's just the people that are pushing this doctrine are the ones that are really benefiting uh, from it, right? Um, but like I said, there's so many ministries in the charismatic movement that do this, and they even say things like, you like the the word of faith people, right? Like have your financial miracle and have your debt canceled. Or I even saw one minister, he was saying, who wants their son delivered from alcoholism? Who wants their, their family member delivered from addiction? And then he was getting ready for them to sow a thousand dollar seed or to sow some kind of financial seed and uh, teaching them that if they did that, that their family member was going to get delivered. And I just think how, how that's so grievous. How are these false teachers going to escape the damnation of hell? They are pulled they are that's full blown manipulation. Like there is not even some like that's the most manipulative thing that you could possibly concoct in your mind that if you sow a thousand dollar seed into me and, and here's another thing they'll do. They'll say, "You're not giving to me, you're giving to God." No, you are giving to that ministry. If you're giving that ministry money, you are giving to them. That's a false dichotomy. That's a that's a sneaky thing people do. They'll say, you're not really giving to me. You know, many times when people start using that language, a red flag should be going off. That's, that's a way they try to manipulate you many times. But anyways, I just think, man, man, I would not want to be in that position telling people their family members are going to get delivered. I would not want to have to answer for that on the day of judgment that if, if you sow a thousand dollar seed, your family member is going to get set free. Think of how many people's faith are being hurt and even shipwrecked as a result of this. But anyways, let's go over some scripture. I wanted to deal with the, the main scriptures that come up with regards to this uh, situation. And like I said, 
Is there a sense at which you could uh, sow into somebody financially and reap some kind of harvest? Most definitely so, yes. But not in the way that these prosperity preachers are teaching that's the case. But anyways, let's go over some passages now and it'll become a little bit more clear to you guys. But I just want to say this as well too before I start reading the passages. When the Word of God talks about sowing seed... It is utterly primarily talking about the word of God or things of that nature and not a financial seed. Many people got it back the other way around. All these parables that Jesus gave about sowing seed and everything like that, it was not in the context of money. Anyways, Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 through 9 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Okay, it's right there. Let's just shut the Bible right there. Case closed. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So if you sow a financial seed of $1,000, you're going to reap a 10, 100 fold increase and you're going to get $10,000 back and get your financial miracle. That's called ripping a verse out of context. That's called mangling the text to try to, you know, derive something uh, out of it. That's not there to begin with. That's You're doing eisegesis. You're inserting something into the text. But we need to read the full context. It goes on to say, and if you look at the, these contexts, right, where it talks about sowing and reaping, you'll see that it's not being used in the way that these money preachers are talking about, right? Look at the context every time and you'll see they're taking it out of context. But it says, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the spirit shall reap uh, shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary and well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So this is talking about not sinning. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap destruction. But if you walk in the spirit. Uh, you're going to be walking in eternal life. If you walk in the fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, meekness, that's what it's talking about. So the whatsoever in this context is in the context of what's being talked about, right? Whatsoever, these two options, whether you sow to the flesh or you sow to the Spirit. It's not whatsoever. This is many times what false teachers and legalistic people do as well too. They'll find one word and they won't let the sentence or the verses define what that term is being used as. So you could just look at that word as whatsoever and just think that you that's universally applicable to literally whatsoever, right? But it's whatsoever in the context of what's being talked about, those two options, sowing to the flesh or sowing to the spirit. So this is talking about a warning about sin, actually, right? This is not some universal law of attraction type principle. And this is actually what this is. This is the law of attraction repackaged. Many of these people, especially the Word of Faith people, they are New Agers. I have a video about this on my YouTube channel describing how the Word of Faith is pretty much the equivalent of, of the New Age. But this is the law of attraction repackaged, that if you just try to attract money, you're going to get money back. You want to attract health, you're going to get health back. You think positively on these things. It's not the same terminology. It's, it's, it, it replaces the new age terminology with talking about faith and sowing and all of these things. But it's essentially the same concept that if you sow money, you're going to attract back money as well too. And I know I've said this before and I'm going to keep saying it. Whenever there's false teaching, there's almost always a good amount of truth. There's bits of truth mixed in with that false teaching. Otherwise, it wouldn't be appealing. Otherwise, it wouldn't attract people to it if it was just straight up a lie. Nobody would be attracted to that, right? So you might be able to point to the bits of truth and be like, no, I'm infuriated. Sowing and reaping, it's biblical. But once again, you know, like I said, they, they, they use biblical concepts. They use biblical terminology to make it appear as though it's truth. But there's actually lies at the foundational teaching thereof. Now, I wanted to go over this passage with you guys. And it's so clear here in Luke chapter 6, this is going to be the main passage that we're going to be in today. And we're just going to go through a bunch of verses here. It's so essential. I know it's going to click with so many of you guys when we go through this passage. In verse 31 of Luke chapter 6, it says, And as ye would that men should do unto you, do ye likewise unto them. So that's the context. Doing unto people as you want them to do unto you. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good unto you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do the same. 
And if ye lend of them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? I just want to highlight that specific example right there. I find it interesting that's in this context. If you lend to those of who you hope to receive when you lend, when you give, what thank have you? For sinners, that's the attitude of a sinner, of I'm going to give something to get something in return. He's saying right here, they do that to receive as much again. It's right there in the word of God, guys. If you have that mentality when you lend, when you give, especially if you give, if it's applicable with lending, how much more with giving? If you do that to receive as much again, uh, what thank have you? Your love is no better than a sinner, according to that right there, right? And then he went on to say, but love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. There it is once again. He said it twice now. Hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Now, there might be some people who are actually looking at the context and being like, hey, Noah, I, I hear what you're saying, but right here it says, your reward shall be great. So that means the Lord is going to re reward us with a financial harvest back once again. Okay, before you take that interpretation, though, let's remember the context. The context is the Sermon on the Mount, right? And we're looking at Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount here in Luke chapter 6. So we know a parallel to this is Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, because that is also the Sermon on the Mount. So if we look at verses in Matthew chapter 5, verse th uh, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, we can draw a, a similar teaching from it, right? It's, it's applicable, relevant passage that's applicable. So Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, he said, Lay up not for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and, uh, and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. And right before this, he was talking about, your reward shall be great. And then he said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth. So can the rewards, according to the context, can they contextually be talking about treasures for yourself upon this earth, financial gain? I don't think so. I find it very hard for you, for you to insert that in the context right here, when right afterwards, Jesus is giving a warning about laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven and not rewards, not material gain on this earth. So the context, according to this passage, is doing good unto people. And there can be some sense of, in which it's talking about financially in this situation. But then it says, if you hope to receive financially again in return, your love is no better than a sinner. So according to the con that can't be the context according to this passage, right? So if you give with that mentality that you will get back, it, it's not it's not of God. It's actually a works-based mentality. No wonder it doesn't work out because then you're approaching giving with a works-based mentality. The way that you should receive from God is a gift of grace that God blesses you not because of any merit of your own, but because you are a child of God. And if we being evil know how to give good gifts unto our children, how much more shall our heavenly father give good gifts unto those who ask him? That's the way that you should approach God with regards to receiving from him, right? Just, just as, a, as a gift of grace. Okay, now let's read the rest of the passage here in Luke chapter 6, because people take this verse and I'm going to skip down just a couple verses. They take verse 38 out of context, where it says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured again unto you. And he spake a parable unto them, Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into a ditch? I find it so interesting that Jesus gave a warning about false teachers right after he got done with this teaching about give and it shall be given unto you. He said, if the blind lead the blind, will they not both fall into a ditch? It's almost like Jesus is warning us immediately afterwards, hey guys, people are going to take this teaching out of context. I don't think it's a coincidence or, or it's random that he just brings up this, uh, this quick parable about a warning about false teachers leading you into a ditch, right? Um, so, you know, people will take this word, give and it shall, right there. You could just take that, give and it shall be given unto you. Hey, if I give a thousand dollars, I'm going to get a thousand dollars in return or $10,000 in return. Uh, but what, if we look at the whole context, we know that that's not contextually right. Second of all, 
And it says right here, men shall give unto your, into your bosom, right? This is talking about if you treat others in the right way, you will receive that back in return. It's not talking about financially sowing a, a seed into a ministry and you receiving the equivalent. And, and, and even with this, it's not like a one-to-one -one ratio. It's not like a slot machine, once again. It's not like a, like a machine where you can put some currency in and get the same equivalent back out. That's not how it works in the spirit realm, that you get the exact same thing. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio. That's really important to understand, even if you do want to look at this in a financial sense, because you can sow in financially by faith and reap a harvest in some sense, but we're going to be looking about how, like I said, that's not necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio. We're going to be looking at some more verses. But on, another thing that I want to say as well too is, when you give, it's not a sacrifice, you know, it's not you donating, it's not you sacrificing anything. If when you give to people, you just get it the same in return, once again, that's actually just a benefit to you. It's like, why wouldn't you do that? It's like some get rich uh, quick type scheme instead. It's not a sacrifice. It's not you donating from a cheerful heart. It's a, it's a financial gimmick to get something back. It's like, what what faith does that take? What financial, if there's this guarantee that you're going to get even, even more, in, the word of God says, don't lend to think that you'll receive as much again. How much more would it be bad to think I'm going to get more like this, uh, like I can treat God or some ministry like a slot machine? That's not, that's not how it works. And that tells me once again, you don't understand God's grace. You have a works-based mentality towards receiving from God. God wants to give to you because he loves you. God wants to bless you because he loves you and not because of this pseudo law of attraction type thing that people are teaching nowadays. Okay. Mark chapter 10 verse 28 says, then Peter began to say unto him, lo, we have left all to follow thee. And Jesus answered and said, verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold. Guys, sow your thousand dollar seed and you'll get a hundredfold. Once again, you could take that out of context right there, but he shall receive a hundredfold. So, so many people do this and people don't even read the Bible. They don't even think about the context of what that means. They just, once again, you could pull any of these verses, a phrase out of these passages and totally make it look like this whole concept is biblical. But it says, shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the world to come eternal life. So here's where I can confidently point to a passage that says it's not an equivalent thing that you receive in return once again, because it says also with persecutions um, and you, it's not literal. It's not like you literally receive a hundred houses. It's not like even the prosperity preachers, they don't have a hundred houses, right? It's not like you literally receive a hundred children or a hundred, hundred mothers or something like that. Right? So that's really important to understand. Another thing as well, too, once again, here in the context, it's not talking about money. It's not like if you give up money to the kingdom of God, you're going to receive a hundredfold money back. I believe this is a more abstract way, a more generalized way, which is being talked about. Like, you know, with maybe a hundred and a uh, hundred brothers and sisters in Christ or like a hundredfold quality, right? Like the family, the friends, the, the relationships, everything that I have now, I could say that I've received a hundredfold, right? Um, in, in a, in a quality type sense and not necessarily quantitative in some sense, it could be quantitative, but once again, it's not talking about money here and it's not literally show any, show me anybody that's got a hundred house. Well, no, you'd actually have to show me everybody that got a hundred houses for that interpretation to be accurate, right? Not just the, the confirmation bias of the prosperity preachers, right? Like I said, it only really works with them, but not with all the people that are, that are giving, right? Okay, so if you give, um, not as a gift of grace, but as a means to receive something again re in return, that's not true love. You know, you give just because you love people and you love God. And God gives to you just because he loves you. Because he has a relationship with you and he loves people, right? It's not like this uh, back and forth situation like that. Like you give and he gives and he, you know, it's just he gives to you out, out of his grace, right? So like I said, this really diminishes the grace of God when you take this mentality as well too. 
okay? Um, and as I'm giving this teaching, I want to reiterate, you, sh you can say I'm giving a financial seed. That's fine. You should donate to ministries out of a cheerful heart. There's some Christians that are stingy, that are cold-hearted. I get all of that. That's not of God. But we shouldn't therefore manipulate people to, to give money. That's not of God either, right? You don't want to go to the other extreme. So um, I want to encourage cheerful giving as I try to do in all my messages about the false prosperity uh, money teaching. I'm not trying to say you should have this mentality of like, oh, a pastor should never get paid, or you shouldn't donate to a ministry, or a minister can't do ministry full-time or something like that. I do ministry full-time myself, and and that's totally fine. But if you give in, with this mentality, it's not of God, guys. It's clear as day, right? You should give because, because you're blessed by God. You should just give out of gratefulness of heart, a cheerful giver, right? And when you're giving, hoping to receive your covetous uh, desires again in return, that's not giving out of a cheerful heart. That's giving out of a covetous heart. Now, I'm going to go over the main, the main passage that people would try to use out of context. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, it says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also uh, reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall, also, uh, shall reap uh, bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So that blows the, the financial tithe out of the water. If you have to give out of necessity, well, <laughs> the, the New Testament doctrine or supposed doctrine of tithing 10% of your income as a mandatory thing is not of God. If you want to give 10% and you want to tithe, that's awesome. That's fantastic. But it says here, not out of necessity or grudgingly, right? Now, people could take this first verse and honestly make a pretty good argument that, hey, this is talking about reaping again financially, if you sow financially, right? Um, but let's, let's keep reading some more verses, okay? It says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. As it is written, he has dis, uh, dispersed abroad he hath given to the poor, for his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So what is the harvest right here? See, it says, you know, sowing and reaping and, and, and harvesting plentiful or harvesting little. What is the harvest in verse 10? Did you guys read it? Did you hear what I said out of this passage right here? Look at that last sentence right there. That, that last part of that last sentence. And increase the fruits or the harvest of your righteousness, not of your financial gain, not of your financial, um, your prosperity. No, in the context right here, the fruit of the harvest is your righteousness. And actually, contextually, we can see it says giving unto the poor. This is talking about giving poor to poor Christians, actually, contextually, not to ministries. Now, is it applicable to ministries? I believe, yes, definitely so, that you should give to ministries out of a cheerful heart, right? But I just wanted to bring that element into it as well, too. Actually, Paul is encouraging the people in the church of Corinth to give to the poor, not to ministries, actually. Is this applicable to ministries? Yes, most definitely so. And let me just take this time to affirm once again. When a Christian becomes born again, do they many times increase in financial prosperity? Most definitely so. Does God want to bless your finances? I believe so. But there are times where people just go through financial hardship. And just because you're not prospering financially, that doesn't mean that you know, you're in sin or you're not of God or you're, you're not sowing your seed faithfully or you're cursed because you're not tithing or something like that, right? Like I said, once again, it's because it's a, it's a gift of grace, you know? So I'll affirm that you should give to ministries with a cheerful heart. And I believe my teaching actually, and I believe God's, the word of God's teaching encourages cheerful giving actually through this method, right? Where you're not bound out of necessity or grudgingly or thinking that God's only going to bless you if you give your thousand dollar seed or something like that, right? Um, because then you're like, like, okay, there's a minister that says these 10 women come up and all of them who sold their thousand dollar seed, they're going to be able to find a marriage. 
Well, what? Now poor, people that are poor, people that can't afford to do that, God doesn't want to give them a marriage? Like God only wants the rich people to be able to marry, or, the, or I shouldn't say rich, but people that have $1,000 to be able to marry? That doesn't make any sense, guys. Just think about it for five seconds and it doesn't make any sense. So I hope you guys get the, the context here, right? This isn't talking about reaping a financial reward. Now, will God bless you financially if you, if you, um, well, I shouldn't say if, but as you love people, as you obey his son, Jesus Christ, if you're faithful with the little, can you be trusted with much? Yes, most definitely so, but not out of this works-based mentality or because you give to some fake prosperity preacher that that's just like some genie in a bottle. That's just like some slot machine type thing that you can use to get your finances. No, that that's what I'm speaking against, right? God will bless your finances. Generally speaking, as you obey Jesus, he'll trust you with much if you're trusted with little. But um, yeah, it, it's not what these people are making it out to be. That's most definitely the case. Okay, guys, um, I have here written down about Simon in Acts chapter 8 how he said that he wanted to try to buy the, the gift of the laying on of hands to impart the Holy Spirit unto people. He wanted to try to pay for that. Um, I've already gone over that before, but that's another, ex I'm not going to go all into detail about it here. I just kind of want to wrap up this message. You could read about that in Acts chapter eight. That's another straight up condemnation of, of charging for deliverance ministry, right? Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse seven through eight. Freely give as you freely received. It's just not of God to charge for deliverance or to charge for any ministry. Um, if people want to sell a book, if people want to sell Christian clothing, if people, you know, like things of that nature, um, sure, that's fine, right? Um, but then again, some people just write books to, to, to become rich as well, too. And some people... They, they're building their own kingdom when they sell merchandise and books and this and courses and this and that and the other thing, you know, and I've made videos about that before. Some of you guys, um, you know, check out some of these other videos I've made. Like I've made like five videos already talking about my stance on these different things. So don't just listen to the deliverance prayers. Check out these teachings that I make as well too, because I, I put some time and effort and I believe that the Lord will bless you and you'll receive wisdom as you check out the teachings as well too. Okay, Matthew chapter 6 though, I'll just finish off this message with this. Verse 31, Take no thought therefore for tomorrow, saying, What shall we eat, what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For all of these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. There is something so awesome in just resting in the fact that God... God already knows what you have need of, and he already has uh, set up means by which for you to be provided for. Just trusting in the sovereignty of God. That's what Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, actually. How would that be reconciled? How would that be able to be reconciled, this passage right here about seek ye first the kingdom of God, with the interpretation that the prosperity money preachers uh, give in the Sermon on the Mount it would be like a straight up contradiction of each other, right? So that's just another thing. Jesus teaching directly on the Sermon on the Mount contradicts the interpretation of, of how the prosperity preachers preach their message about the Sermon on the Mount and give and sh shall be given unto you and all these different things, right? Okay, but, but your heavenly father knows that you have need of the, these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. And I can testify that's the case in my life. I started doing full-time ministry a while back by the grace of God, just did it by faith. And the Lord is faithful to provide. He most definitely is. So don't fall into covetousness. Don't fall into the love of money. Um, we shouldn't have a poverty mindset, but that doesn't mean that we can go to the other extreme either, right? And once again, I've talked on that before. So one thing that I haven't spoken on though, done a direct teaching on, yet yeah, is the tithing. Let me know right now down in the comment section if you guys want me to make a video on the biblical position of New Testament or what people claim to be the New Testament version of tithing. Okay, guys? So I'll see you guys in the next video. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.